Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 331, The Doolittle Raid, Part 2. Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and his B-25 crews arrived in California on April 1st. The pilots were excited. Finally, a chance to strike back. However, their leaders, Admirals Halsey and Nimitz, the latter now the C&C Pacific Fleet, were far from convinced of the wisdom of this operation. Looking at the Pacific Theater in general, at this time the Japanese were conducting their own raids as far west as the Indian Ocean and had even bombed Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka. But more importantly, the Americans did not know where the enemy was going to focus next. Hence, was it all that wise to send two of Nimitz's four carriers close to the Japanese home islands just for a bomb run that could only do so much damage? Besides which, the USS Saratoga had been hit by a torpedo on January 11th and would eventually end up in San Diego in late May for additional repairs. Added to this, because of operational damage, two of the 24 modified B-25s would not be making the trip. Doolittle was now down to 22 planes. This counterpunch was getting weaker by the day. Back to the fear of how this raid could turn out, C&C U.S. Fleet and Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest J. King wasn't all that impressed either. Not with the raid, per se, but the chances of Task Force 16 and 18 making it safely back to Hawaii. There was the larger war to consider. But then King was told by SyncPAC's, or C&C Pacific Fleet's, intelligence staff that the enemy had just stopped their major operations in the Indian Ocean and did not seem to be ready to invade Australia. Their best guess was that New Guinea was about to become their next victim. As this calmed King down, Nimitz gave the operation his full support. When Task Force 18, centered around Admiral Mark Mitcher's carrier Hornet, left San Francisco Bay at 10 a.m. on April 2nd, it was screened against enemy subs and planes by coastal-based subs and planes. But once she was out to sea, it would be her escorts and fighters that would take over, and these assets were considerable. Sailing around the Hornet was the cruiser Vincennes, the light cruiser Nashville, and the destroyer division, or DESDIV-22, of four destroyers, the Gwyn, Meredith, Grayson, and Monson. And keeping their oil tanks full was the Cimarron, a fleet tanker. As for her air arm, that was equally impressive. Air Group 8 had 30 folding wing Grubman F4F-4 Wildcats, the newest version, a squadron of Douglas SBD-3s, Dauntless Dive Bombers, a squadron of Scout Planes, again Douglases, for a total of 24. Lastly, there was a squadron of Torpedo Flying Bombers, 10 Douglas TBD-1 Devastator Torpedo Bombers. Also on board the Hornet were 16 of Doolittle's modified B-25s, with its complement of 70 officers and 130 enlisted members. And 15 of those 16 B-25s were earmarked for Tokyo. The 16th plane was to have taken off when the task force was 100 miles from the coast, as the pilots had never seen a B-25 launch from a carrier. But at the last minute, it was scrubbed as spies might witness this unusual sight, and put two and two together. Now that Task Force 18 was out on her own, there would be strict radio silence, unless there arose an extreme emergency. From now on, all communications would be through semaphore, the system of sending messages by holding two flags or poles in certain positions, according to an alphabetic code. And now that they were out to sea, Admiral Mitcher told his crew what Doolittle and company were going to do. Mitcher recorded the men's reactions. Morale reached a high point, there to remain until after the attack was launched. But the more Admiral Nimitz thought about Task Force 18, the more he worried. He needed that carrier, its escorts, and as many planes as possible to return to Pearl. Pearl. 
Thus, he ordered Admiral Halsey's Task Force 16 to depart Hawaii and meet up with Michener for added protection. The second carrier would also be needed as any planes that took off from the Hornet would not be able to land there, as Doolittle's planes took up too much deck space. Instead, they would land on the Enterprise until the B-25s were gone. When the two task forces joined, they would be labeled under Halsey's Task Force 16 for security, and Halsey's force closely mirrored Michener's group. Around Halsey's carrier Enterprise were two cruisers and a division of destroyers, here DESDIV-12, of four destroyers, the Balk, Benham, Ellet, and Fanning. They would all be kept running by the fleet oiler Sabine. On board the flagship Enterprise were F-4F-4s, the newest models, some F-4F-3s, a squadron of dive bombers and SBD-2s, that is, three dauntless aircraft, and a squadron of torpedo bombers. The attack plan also had the submarines Trout and Thresher that would go on ahead to gather weather information and enemy intelligence. Now, all those involved in the decision-making process of Special Aviation Project No. 1 knew there was a chance that this entire thing may not go off at all. For around the time Halsey's task force departed Pearl Harbor, near midday on April 8th, the enemy's ability to sink Allied vessels had only grown. Just three days after Task Force 18 left the California coast on April 5th, the British lost the heavy cruisers HMS Cornwall and Dorsetshire, and the destroyer HMS Tenedos in the Indian Ocean. In late March, having received reports that the Japanese were going to be attacking in the Indian Ocean, and indeed some of their fast-moving carriers were sent there to disrupt the convoys in that part of the world, like the JS-1 convoy going from Colombo, Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka, to the Dutch East Indies in early February, the Eastern Fleet under Admiral James Somerville, was sent out to scout the area. But by April 4th, with no enemy vessels spotted, the Dorsetshire and her sister ship Cornwall were sent back to Colombo, the former to resume a refit, the latter to refuel, to then participate in a convoy that was going to Australia. But on that same day, April 4th, the two heavy cruisers were spotted by a Japanese reconnaissance plane from the heavy cruiser Tone. Knowing now that they had to depart Colombo, the capital and largest city of Sri Lanka, they set sail for Adu Atoll, the southernmost atoll of the Maldives, just after midnight, now early April 5th. Despite this, the Japanese reconnaissance plane picked them up again that morning. Located about 200 miles or 370 kilometers southwest of Sri Lanka, the two heavy cruisers were set upon by 53 Aichi D3A2 Val dive bombers launched from two enemy carriers. Eight minutes into the attack, the Dorsetshire was hit ten times by 250-pound or 110-kilogram and 500-pound or 250-kilogram bombs. Thus, she was doomed. But as one of those bombs set off her ammunition magazine, the Dorsetshire went down that much faster. Going down stern first at 1.50 p.m., she was joined by the Cornwall ten minutes later, which had been struck eight times. On board both ships were 1,546 men, of which 1,122 were saved by the cruiser Enterprise and the destroyers Paladin and Panther the next day. As for the destroyer HMS Tenedos, being an older vessel, commissioned in 1919, she was sent to Asia just before the war broke out so the newer ships could guard closer to home as tensions with Nazi Germany rose. In August of 1939, Tenedos and her sister ships Scout, Thanet, and Thracian were stationed at Hong Kong, but then were sent to Singapore to lay mines. Just after Germany invaded Poland, 544 mines were laid near Singapore. But as the Americans found out, 
in early 1942, when trying to deal with German subs off of Hatteras, North Carolina, mines could be a double-edged sword, as two Allied merchant ships were sunk by friendly mines. When RAF aircraft spotted two large Japanese convoys in the South China Sea on December 5th, all of the elements of Force Z, led by the battleship Prince of Wales and battle cruiser Repulse, and including the Tenedos, were recalled from various locations. By December 8th, Force Z was en route to attack the Japanese invasion fleets near Thailand. But at 6.30 p.m. on December 9th, Tenedos was peeled off and sent back to Singapore to refuel. Though in different locations and heading in different directions, the Prince of Wales, Repulse, and Tenedos were all attacked on December 10th. The first two vessels were lost to enemy bombs and torpedoes by 1.20 p.m. With the loss of the capital ships, Tenedos and her crew of 90 officers and men, having survived the attack, went on escorting convoys, rescuing men from sunk merchant ships, and then, in late February, fleeing after the Battle of the Java Sea. The Tenedos had not been involved there, but rather had been seeking out the enemy. Then, after picking up more survivors from the lost Battle of Sumatra, she put in at Colombo in modern-day Sri Lanka, needing repairs. And that was her condition when the Japanese carriers rushed into the Indian Ocean. The bombing of the Tenedos that quickly followed saw the loss of the ship, along with 33 officers and men. But there was even more bad news before the two American task forces met up on April 13th. As the attack at Pearl Harbor showed the dominance of carrier-based air power, the last thing the British needed was to lose their very first carrier ever built. HMS Hermes, but that's exactly what happened on April 9th. The construction of the Hermes started during the Great War, but technically speaking, the Japanese were able to launch theirs, the Hosho, first. The Hermes served time in the Atlantic, Mediterranean, and in China. Before the French were knocked out of the war, the Hermes helped French vessels hunt down German commerce raiders. Then, in a twist of irony, the carrier was sent against the French battleship Richelieu. But it was against the Italians during the Somaliland campaign in East Africa that the carrier and the British had more success. This was followed up by another successful participation in the Anglo-Iraqi War in May of 1941. After a refitting, she was sent to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, in February of 1942. But the story of the Hermes ends on April 9th, when stationed at Trincomalee on Sri Lanka's east coast. Hearing of the Japanese air raid on Colombo on the island's west coast, the Hermes and HMAS Vampire, an Australian destroyer, were sent away, but then recalled as British fighters at Trincomalee were going to provide fighter cover. But what came at them all were 85 Aichi D-38 dive bombers, escorted by nine Mitsubishi A6M-0 fighters. Needless to say, the defending fighter cover was not enough, as 32 dive bombers went after the Hermes and kept going after her until she was sunk. In the area, at least three other Allied ships were also sent below the waves. The Hermes lost 307 men, including its captain, Richard F.J. Onslow. The Vampire, also sunk, lost its captain and seven crewmen. She had been set upon by 16 Val dive bombers, but shot one of them down. However, she was hit by 16 bombs, which broke her in half. Ten minutes later, she disappeared. Her ensign was the last thing to go under. The Japanese paid the price of four torpedo bombers for these victories, an advantageous exchange, many would say. So, by the time Halsey's Task Force 16 and Mitcher's Task Force 18 met up at 6 a.m. on April 13th, the Allies had lost numerous vessels in the Pacific Theater. The Doolittle Raid, a gesture of defiance on the Americans' part, was needed 
more than ever. Bad weather had delayed the rendezvous, but now that they had joined, officially becoming Task Force 16, the various crews were kept busy with drills as the combined fleets sailed west. Doolittle's pilots attended lectures by Lieutenant Commander Stefan Jeruka, who had served in Tokyo from 1939 to 1941 as a naval attaché. Using his knowledge of the geography, he pointed out landmarks to help the pilots find their targets. He also highlighted anti-air battery locations and enemy fighter tactics. Meanwhile, gunnery and turret practice was kept up at an intense pace, in case the carriers needed to be defended should they be spotted approaching the Japanese home islands. During Halsey's and Fletcher's hit-and-run raids on the Marshall and Gilbert Islands on February 1st, the gun crews had underperformed when some of the enemy land-based bombers came at them, which was then Task Force 17. There had been too many close calls. That would not happen again if Halsey had anything to do with it. While those guns were going off, the crews were drilled on celestial navigation. The navigators sighting stars and those going with Doolittle were given basic instruction on first aid and field sanitation. All the while, the modified B-25s were checked and rechecked. The maintenance crews were determined that if something went wrong, it would not be with their planes. Now that the task forces were officially Task Force 16, Halsey ordered a course of 265 degrees west at 16 knots. Unless something unforeseen altered the plan, the attack would take place on April 19th. Reconnaissance flights were sent out 200 miles in front of the task force. The two submarines, Trout and Thresher, were already in Japanese home waters, but hopefully the bombers that were coming would have a lot more luck than the subs did. As there could be no witnesses to the approaching task force, the Trout fired two torpedoes at two small cargo ships on April 9th. Both torpedoes missed. The next day, the sub launched another torpedo at a steamer. It also missed. The day after that, the Trout launched two torpedoes at a large freighter with only one torpedo making contact. The freighter sailed on, only slightly damaged. Meanwhile, the Thresher was patrolling at a point where the coming bombers would leave the Pacific Ocean and enter Tokyo Bay to gather weather information. Like the Trout, the Thresher attacked several ships in the area, but had a low success rate. Its biggest score was a 5,000-ton freighter near Yokohama. But having given itself away, the Thresher was herself chased and harassed by a sub-chaser. The Thresher was damaged but continued on with its mission. Fortunately for Doolittle and his pilots, both subs reported that no large naval vessels were spotted in the area. As this entire attack was to demonstrate American swagger, that the latest ally to enter the war would not be intimidated into accepting defeat or approach the negotiating table with head bowed, there was another, smaller demonstration placed inside the larger one that was the raid itself. Attached to several of the bombs that were about to be dropped over Tokyo, Japanese medals given to U.S. Navy crewmen back in 1908, which was to show Japan's friendship with the United States, were about to be returned to sender with interest. <laughs> 